My name's David McCoy. I'm the director of MEDACT, but I'm also a part-time uh, senior academic at Queen Mary University, London. I've got a background in medicine. Um, I spent probably just over half my career working in, in Africa on health programs of various sorts to do with HIV and TB and malaria. Um, quite what I'm doing talking about fracking is something that I still try and work out myself uh, on a daily basis. I kind of fell into fracking as an issue um, about a year and a half ago or two years ago when I heard a debate between the, one of the senior figures in Public Health England and uh, another senior person in the world of public policy um, having a fierce debate about whether fracking was good or bad for the country. Um, and I looked into it. And the more I looked into it, the more I felt that the report that was produced by Public Health England was insufficient, it was inadequate, it was incomplete. And it really required uh, another public health uh, report that would be a bit more comprehensive in its assessment of, of shale gas and its impacts. Um, but my background does not lend me to being an expert in shale gas. Um, but I would say that there are few people anywhere on this planet who can really be an expert on shale gas. And the reason for that is because if you look at shale gas and its full impacts on the environment and on human health, it, would, it really is an issue that covers a whole range of disciplines and areas of expertise, um, from geology to the envir environmental sciences to toxicology to engineering to climate science. Um, I think it's very difficult to find anyone who can be an expert in a full range of those issues. Um, however, I would say that I'm, I've now become a well-informed generalist um, on the issue of, of shale gas. Um, and that's required um, drawing on the expertise of people that work in different disciplines. Um, um, and I think and I hope that we've done that um, as best as we can. Um, MEDACT is an organisation that campaigns, but it also an organisation that prides itself on being evidence-based, on being a professional organisation. Um, and being also a part-time academic, nothing is more precious to me than my credibility as a scientist um, and as an academic um, and as a public health professional. However, part of being a public health professional also requires you to just move beyond assessing the evidence to also acting on the evidence and engaging with public policy and, uh, and, and public issues. Um, and I think MEDACT, having looked at the evidence, having looked at um, shell gas, has arrived at a particular position in terms of the debate. Um, but I think the debate is important um, to recognise, and I'm really pleased to have um, Oni Rutter here, to provide the other side to the argument. Um, what you've got um, is a document that um, is work in progress um, and it's an attempt to really consolidate the evidence base to our position on, on shale gas and, and fracking. Um, but it's work in progress um, and we're hoping to complete it over the next three or four weeks. Um, but I do want to say um, a couple of things about evidence, um, which is that the evidence is limited. The knowledge about shale gas and its potential impacts is limited. This is still a relatively new industry. Um, that the science is incomplete. Um, that there is a great deal of uncertainty about shale gas and its impacts that, and its variable from one place to another. Um, even within the US, the impacts of shale gas are variable from state to state um, for a variety of reasons. Um, there's a reliance on, on, uh, on, on publications, um, scientific publications and academic publications for an organisation like MEDAC that we are, are reliant on 
publications being produced in the academic literature. Um, but we're also aware that um, it can be difficult to interpret the scientific evidence because um, there is also a close relationship, I think, between the oil and gas industry and um, significant aspects of academia, which I think can introduce bias to what is published. So this is really a minefield um, and it is very difficult. It, it does require us to not just gather the evidence, but also to interpret the evidence and finally to form a judgment on the evidence. So not all of this can be science-based, some of it requires a degree of judgment. Um, and that judgment is dependent, not, not sh just shaped by rationality and, and understanding of the data, but it's also shaped by one's views um, and one's attitudes um, about issues like equity, um, about issues um, to do with how much we are concerned about the future. Um, and the kind of trade-offs that we're willing to take between what we have now with what we may uh, risk in terms of the future. So there are all kinds of uh, judgments and uh, normative positions that also influence um, the MEDAP position in terms of shale gas and fracking. Um, so knowledge and evidence only goes so far. Judgment is also required and that is shaped by values and attitudes. Um, so on that point, I think i also like to just state very explicitly up front um, that we have no vested interest in shale gas and we have no vested interest in renewable energy. Um, there is no conflict of interest as far as I can see in terms of my personal work on shale gas and in terms of MEDAC's work on shale gas. Um, I don't think any, w I, yeah, we don't live in what's been described as the sacrifice zone. I live in London. Um, um, and all this work on shale gas has been largely unfunded. And it's really been driven by intellectual curiosity and a wish to provide a public service. Uh, most of this work has been done at weekends and at evenings in, in a completely unfunded manner. Um, so that's just the introduction. Um, what, what I want to try and get through this morning is to provide an overview of what's in the MEDAC report. Um, it's not possible to go into all the detail and I hope um, that you'll be able to read the detail um, in, in the document. The final version will be published in about uh, three or four weeks time. But I, I want to give an overview of MEDAC's position um, after I speak, we'll have Patrick Saunders that will speak um, in more detail on the evidence linking fracking to health impacts, human health impacts. That will then be followed by Joe, who will be looking in depth at the issues around regulation. Um, and then we've got Grant Allen that will speak um, in more detail on the relationships between shale gas and climate change. Um, and then finally, we'll have an opportunity to hear from Ernie the, uh, the, the, the counter argument about why shale gas is, uh, might be considered to be of, of benefit. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to have a, a little bit of a debate. Um, in our report, we, we actually go some way, our, our new report, we actually go some way to highlight the fact that there is an argument about shale gas being beneficial. There is, um, <coughs> and, and that argument consists of shale gas producing a variety of economic benefits in the form of investment into local areas that might host a shale gas industry, um, employment and revenue. Um, shale gas is something that will ultimately, if produced, be sold on the energy markets and potentially bring a significant amount of revenue, not just to the companies that produce shale gas, that exploit the shale gas, but to the local and national economy as a whole. Um, and then finally, shale gas is energy, um, and energy itself is something of huge benefit from a health perspective. Um, there is an argument that it's not just um, energy, but it's a clean form of energy or cleaner form of energy, and that it also serves um, a number of security objectives. 
in terms of securing energy sources um, um, through the provision of domestic energy as opposed to uh, reliance on energy imported from elsewhere. Um, and I think it's really important to remind ourselves just how important energy is from a public health perspective. Um, and if you look at the quite amazing improvements in human health over the last two centuries, um, both in terms of numbers of people living on this planet, in terms of life expectancy, uh, infant mortality rates, I mean, they're quite remarkable changes over the last two centuries. And much of that has been underpinned by our ability to harness the energy that is contained within fossil fuel. Um, so we, we, from a public health perspective, need to recognise that many of our gains that we've achieved as a species over the last two centuries in terms of health improvement have been very closely connected with our ability to harness energy uh, from fossil fuel. Clearly, the potential benefits of, um, of shale gas um, is dependent on a range of modulating factors, what we describe as modulating factors um, in, in our report. Um, and you know, the economic benefits, for example, of a shale gas industry developing in the UK will be dependent on what happens with energy markets and um, things like the price of, uh, of, of gas um, and the relative price of gas um, um, in relation to other sources of energy. Um, it will depend on fiscal policy, it will depend on um, who pays for the development of, of an industry um, and who also pays for all the inputs and requirements um, that will be necessary to mitigate the negative, potentially negative impacts of the industry um, and the extent to which the externalities related to shale gas um, will be borne by the general public or by the general taxpayer. So there's all kinds of issues about um, who will pay and who will benefit from shale gas um, and um, who exactly will benefit economically um, from the development of a shale gas industry. So there will be health benefits and economic benefits that will come out of a shale gas industry. The question is, um, how will that be distributed across the population? Um, and who will bear the risk? And finally, who will be harmed as well? Because the issue of shale gas is not whether there is risk and potential harm. Um, there is risk, there will be harm, but it's a question really of the trade-off between the benefits and the risks and the harms on the other side. Um, so I think most people in this room probably understand what shale gas development is and what unconventional shale gas production consists of. Um, but for maybe the few of you that don't know, um, there are other experts in this room that would be you know, in a much better position to, to describe this. But, um, but from my perspective, when I try and describe this to, to my students at Queen Mary University London, I've described shale gas in terms of the drilling of a vertical borehole into the ground to reach shale formations that lie deep underground. This then, um, from the vertical borehole, we get horizontal boreholes that are drilled into the shale formation itself. Um, the reason why we um, talk about, we use the word fracking, is because these horizontal boreholes, bore um, we then inject large volumes, high volumes of fluid um, under high pressures um, through the vertical boreholes in order to essentially fracture the shale rock in order to be able to release gas that is effectively embedded within that shale rock. Um, and it's the fracturing of the shale rock 
that allows gas to be released um, and then that gas is brought out to the surface. Um, large amounts of fluid are required to be pumped into, in, into the earth um, uh, under high volume and high pressure. Um, and it's this fracturing process that, that is why this, the gas that is eventually produced is described as being unconventional as opposed to conventional gas, which is, um, you can see, no, there's no pointer, um, which is extracted from more conventional reservoirs of gas underground, which are much more easy to, uh, to, to extract and bring to the surface. Um, there are issues about the fluid that is injected um, in terms of the amount of fluid that returns to the surface. So we inject large amounts of fluid. Some of it remains underground and some of it returns to the surface. And when it returns to the surface, it returns in a different form. Um, what comes back up to the surface is a mixture of what goes down and, um, and fluid that is already um, underground. Um, there, there are waters and fluid that are already underground. And the process of fracking itself will create um, all kinds of constituents that enter the water, the fluid that is then brought up um, to the surface. Um, the gas that is eventually brought to the surface has to be cleaned, uh, purified, and there are a variety of ways in which that is done. Um, um, but eventually that gas has to be either transported into uh, the gas pipe infrastructure or liquefied and transported in, um, as, as liquefied natural gas. So, um, so there's a lot of engineering in this um, and a lot of amazing technology um, that is involved. Um, and I've constantly marveled at at these engineering developments that have occurred over time, um, at the ability to, to drill so deep down and horizontally, I think there are horizontal wells that are now three kilometers long, uh, is that right? Or even more? Um, and this ability to then extract gas from shale rock um, deep underground and at such long lengths um, horizontally. Um, there are all kinds of uh, details that, um, that need to be thought about um, when, when understanding hy hydraulic fracturing. Um, what happens to the water? How does the water mix with the gas that comes up? Um, what is the potential for leakages um, from both the vertical borehole and horizontally? Um, there are issues also about um, um, how much fracking actually goes on and the, the fact that stages that the, the, the shale gas, the, sorry, the shale formations are fracked in stages and that different parts of the shale rock can be refracked multiple times. So how often the shale rock is fracked um, can have a bearing on the amount of fluid that is required, the amount of water that is required. Um, in order to fracture that, that rock. Um, so the more you read into this industry, um, the more you realise just how complex it is and how complicated it is. Um, and it is quite difficult to get a good lay understanding of shale gas production as, as an industry. Um, and I hope what we've been able to write in our report provides the right balance between detail um, um, and simplicity so that um, anyone, um, whether you're a public health professional or an ordinary citizen, can develop a good informed understanding of, of this industry. That's our hope anyway. Um, as far as I can work out, the lifespan of a well is variable and it's still a little bit unclear, um, but from what I can see, people talk about the lifespan of a well being often around two to five years. 
that be right? It could be 20 years. And it could be 20 years. So again, this kind of speaks to the variability that exists within this industry, that some wells may only be fracked and their lifespan may, may last no longer than two years, five years, could be anything up to 20 years. Um, so there's no, from what I can see, there's no typical, there's no such thing as a typical shale gas well or shale gas production site. Um, there is such a large amount of variability um, from site to site or from well to well. Um, okay, so in terms of, um, of the risks, so I started off by, by wanting to acknowledge that there are potential health benefits associated with shale gas that are linked to the production of energy, that are linked to potential economic benefits. But in terms of the risks, in our report, we've constructed a framework to help organize the different sets of risks that are associated with shale gas. Um, so they begin with looking at the potential risks associated with the production of hazardous pollutants, hazardous materials and pollutants that may be airborne or waterborne. Um, there are also a set of what we call public health nuisances that are associated with shale gas. And these are related to the industrial outputs of noise, um, of light pollution, potentially bad smells, um, and heavy traffic. And this is what Patrick will be speaking to in, in greater detail um, after me. There are also potentially negative impacts on health that are derived through social and economic pathways. So fracking will be a disruptive industry, potentially disruptive industry at a social level. And while it may bring economic benefits in, the, in terms of investment, employment and revenue, it could also have economic disbenefits on other sectors within the local economy, agriculture, tourism, leisure. <coughs> So there are potentially economic disbenefits. In terms of geological um, impacts, in terms of earthquakes, um, that's been talked about quite, quite frequently, uh, particularly in the kind of in, on, on social media sites and in the lay press. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this. I don't think earthquakes are a significant immediate threat. Um, However, I think there are seismic events that may increase the risk of pollution into the environment um, and increase the risk of the final pathway, which is related to greenhouse gas emissions and in particular fugitive emissions of methane. Um, and the impact of greenhouse gas emissions on health is mediated through primarily the pathway of climate change. It's not a direct impact on human health in communities that surround fracking sites, but it's an impact on human health that is mediated through the potential risks associated with climate change, with global warming. So when you think about exposure to these risks, <coughs> and if you include climate change in the mix, we've got to be thinking not just about the potential negative effects on local communities, but also the potential negative effects at a national and global level, because climate change is really a global health threat that can't be parceled out um, um, on a local or country-wide basis. And, um, and there are also a variety of occupational health risks um, that are particular and specific to those people that actually work on the well pad itself. Um, we've described in our report um, issues around concerns that are associated with the large amount of water that is required to sustain the industry, to sustain the um, high volume um, hydraulic fracturing process, where will this water come from, how much water is required, will it have an impact on other sectors 
at a local level. Um, that's described in the report. Um, and we have a big section in the report that talks to the critical issue of what happens with the wastewater that is eventually produced on the surface. Um, and there are real concerns, um, I think, about our capacity and ability to manage the wastewater. Um, so I won't go into that in detail right now, but the detail is described in, in the report. Um, I think there are issues from a health perspective, but there are also issues in terms of how the wastewater may potentially impact on the environment. Um, and there may also be economic implications that managing some of the toxic wastewater that will come to the surface um, could be potentially costly and um, needs to be looked at from a wider economic perspective. Certainly there's some evidence from the US um, that have suggested that, um, that the public, um, the taxpayer, that municipal authorities have had to, bur have ha have had to sh shoulder a disproportionate burden of the management of this wastewater. Um, there are issues around groundwater contamination which, um, which have sparked quite a lot of debate um, and controversy and um, I know that David Smythe is, is pretty much um, at the heart of some of that controversy um, and essentially um, this controversy is, is really centred around the concerns that people have about the risk that shale gas may have in terms of the pollution of freshwater aquifers. And there is on one side a set of arguments that say that hydraulic fracturing happens very, very deep and far away from aquifers which are much shallower underground. And that everything that goes on at that level of hydraulic fracturing um, does not pose a risk to the potential pollution of aquifers that are much more higher up in the strata. Um, and that the fracturing process itself and for a variety of geological reasons um, does not pose a significant threat to contamination of aquifers. On the other side, there is a minority opinion that there are risks and that the risks potentially in the UK are greater than the risks in the US for geological reasons. Um, and secondly, that there are also risks associated with contamination of aquifers, not because of what happens at the strata where the shale formations lie, but because of what happens further up along the vertical borehole itself, that there are ways in which there are potential pathways um, between um, the boreholes and shallow aquifers that could pose a risk to, to freshwater aquifers that are higher up um, in the ground. Um, we've tried to reflect that debate in our report. Um, as best we can um, and I think this comes to a really important point about fracking um, which is that it's really really hard to come to any very clear um, and definitive measure of the risk in terms of groundwater pollution but also in terms of many of the other risks um, that are associated with shale gas. What we can say is that there is a hazard, there is a risk, but it's very hard to quantify it in, in, in clear and measurable terms. So I think there is a risk of aquifers being polluted. There is certainly evidence from the US that aquifers have been polluted, but what's much more difficult to answer is how big a risk is this? and how frequent is the risk of pollution 
and if pollution occurs, how much pollution will occur and to what extent is that potential pollution of significance. Um, there are controversies and debates around the potential cause and source of that pollution and the pathways um, that may be involved in the contamination of, of aquifers, of groundwater. And of course, there, there's also the risk of, of, of surface water being polluted in, and being contaminated as well. David will speak later about um, the nature of the shale formations in the U UK, and presumably you will as well, Ernie. Um, and to what extent can we take the experience in the US and apply it to, to the UK? I think, um, I think there are all kinds of issues about the ability to, transpo you know, to, to transpose evidence from the US to the UK. Um, we have to use the evidence from the US, but we need to be careful about how we interpret that evidence and apply it to the UK context. Not just because of geological differences, but also because of social differences, demographic differences, geographical differences as well. Um, there's, to my mind, a big issue around well integrity. Um, to what extent can we construct wells, boreholes, um, that will not fail? Not fail in terms of producing leaks. Leakages, not just of fluid, but also of, of gas. Um, and again, very complex. Um, I've spent many, many hours trying to read academic papers on the geomechanics of well construction. Um, I've done my best to understand stand this, but uh, I think one of the important things that I learnt is that the pathways for leakages um, can occur in, I mean, there, there are many different potential pathways. Um, and that the, the, the well that we, when we think about a well, we need to think about steel casing we need to think about the cement, and then we need to think about the rock. And that pathways for leakages <coughs> can occur as a result of problems associated with the steel and the casings, with the cement, and with the rock. Um, so this is, again, another area of, I, th I feel, technical complexity, but it's important that we have some understanding um, about it. Um, but I just put this up because um, it, it just illustrates and demonstrates <coughs> that there are many potential uh, pathways for gas to leak out of, of um, um, yeah, to, to leak out of the borehole, out of the well. Um, and that this may be the result of cement failure, cement cracking, corrosion, and cracking of the steel casings. Um, and that there are also issues related to the geology itself, the rock itself, that surrounds the, um, the well bore. The, from what I can see of the evidence in the US, that there are many factors that can help determine uh, the, the rate of uh, well integrity failure. Um, certainly, from what I can see, high volume hydraulic fracturing, because of the high pressures that are involved, um, can increase the rate of well integrity failure relative to conventional uh, wells, the length of the, of the borehole is, is a factor, the degree of curvature, um, geological faults that may exist in the area, and operator practice itself. You know, how, how good are the operators? Um, how careful do they do the drilling, and how careful do they construct the wells um, in their operations? Well integrity is really important because of this issue of fugitive emissions, which I want to come to now. And fugitive emissions are defined as gases, um, we're mainly talking about methane here, um, that are unintentionally lost to the atmosphere during the process of gas extraction, collection, processing and transportation. And these are emissions that can emanate from below the ground into the surface or emanate from above the ground in through 
the gas infrastructure that's required to process and, and, and transport gas. It's worth remembering that there's also intentional release of gas directly into the atmosphere, um, and this is not included in the definition of fugitive emissions. Why is this important? What is the relevance of this? The relevance of this is because methane is in itself a potent greenhouse gas, um, and it has a direct impact on climate change. Uh, so, so methane and gas doesn't just have an impact on global warming through the burning of the gas, but also through the direct release of the gas into the atmosphere. So the amount of gas that is released directly into the atmosphere um, is really important from a climate change perspective. Um, and how do we measure it? How do we calculate how much gas is released? I mean, we can calculate it and measure it in terms of the actual amount of methane that is released into the atmosphere. But very often you'll see that it's calculated as a percentage of the total, total gas that is produced from the well. Um, and finally, we need to think about measuring it in terms of its global warming potential. And here is another area of complexity and controversy, um, because when we talk about the global warming potential, we often measure it in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, there are many different greenhouse gases. The most commonly referred to is carbon dioxide, probably has the biggest impact in terms of global warming. But in order to get an equivalent measure about the impact in terms of global warming, we have to convert the amount of methane into a metric that can be equivalent to carbon dioxide. So this is often referred to as carbon dioxide equivalent. But there is issues here because the global warming impact of methane is much shorter, has a much shorter time frame than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide exists in the atmosphere and will remain in the atmosphere for up to 100 years, whereas methane is rapidly degraded, much more rapidly degraded from the atmosphere. It has a much shorter time, um, uh, time span in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So when you measure the global warming potential of methane, you have to think about whether you measure it across a 100-year time span, which is what we measure in terms of carbon dioxide, or in terms of a 20 or 30-year time span. And this can have a huge effect in terms of determining whether shale gas is cleaner than, for example, coal or oil the time horizon that you use to measure the global warming potential of natural gas um, can have quite a profound impact in terms of the equations that are used to compare gas as a source of energy relative to coal, oil or other fossil fuels. So this is another area of complexity, debate, controversy and uncertainty in the literature which again, I hope is adequately reflected in our, in our document. And I hope Grant Allen will speak to this in more detail. Um, fugitive emissions is not just from the production process, but it's also involved in the transportation of gas to the final end user of gas in, in homes or in factories or wherever else gas is used. Um, our report also talks about the wider social, economic and ecological effects of shale gas as an industry, the impact on the landscape, the effect it may have on our appreciation of natural beauty, um, the character of I know, living in a rural area. Um, there's been lots of reference made to shale gas industrialising the countryside. Um, there's also been lots in the literature about shale gas being a relatively limited industry, that it won't last forever, and that 
the countryside can recover after the industry has had its, uh, had its impact. Um, but I've yet to see an independent and comprehensive social, economic and ecological impact assessment of shale gas. Neither in the US nor in the UK. And we haven't provided that in our report, but we do make the point that this is a gap. This has not yet been done. And that we do need to consider these wider effects of the industry. Um, very difficult to do, um, but I think it is important to do. Um, the, the, the negative, the risks and potential harms of shale gas, as I've alluded to, very difficult to quantify and measure in a precise form for <coughs> a variety of reasons already explained. And in our report, we describe and we list the list, we have a list of modulating factors um, that have a bearing on the ultimate level of degree of risk, negative risk to, to health or to the environment. Um, and a really important one is the intensity of fracking. How many well pads, how many boreholes, how much fracking is actually going to take place? Um, one or two exploratory wells bears no relation in terms of being able to measure the risk to fracking at scale, commercial fracking at uh, industrial scale. Um, and as far as I can see, it's still a bit unclear to me exactly what full scale commercial shale gas production would look like um, in the UK. Um, it depends very much on the proximity and the size of the surrounding population. Um, very much dependent on in industry behaviour, very much dependent on the effectiveness um, and capacity of the regulatory system, which Joe will speak to. Depends on the geology, the geography, the lo local social and economic context, the fiscal um, context, and also ultimately on wider climate change mitigation um, policies um, and efforts. Um, so arriving at a conclusion about whether shale gas is good or bad really does require a fairly sophisticated um, and holistic look at a wide range of issues. Um, and it, it's very diff I think a number of people talked about arriving at an instinctive position. Um, and I think I also arose, um, you know, I found myself having an uh, initial instinctive um, reaction to shale gas. Um, but the more I've looked into it, the more I've realised just how complex it is. Um, and <coughs> that it is important to arrive at a position that is based on, on making the time and effort to look at shale gas from a, from a holistic perspective. Um, so this is how we concluded in our initial report. We, we said that it was impossible to arrive at a precise level of risk to human health, but we did recognise that the hazards were substantial, um, that it, the, the risk and threat to health was associated and dependent on multiple factors. Um, and we also mentioned that the perceived risk to health, whether it was real or not, was in itself a hazard to health. And I have observed with my own eyes the high level of stress that, um, that a number of communities now feel um, about shale gas, um, the anxiety, the depression, the sleep disturbance that it's already causing. All these are, are, are very much um, real hazards um, and already having a health impact. At the same time, this is a, a slide that I've used a number of times when talking about shale gas. It's a slide showing traffic in London. Um, and in my view, the impact on health that arises from traffic and air pollution in London is likely to be far greater than the impact that shale gas ha will have in terms of a direct health impact on surrounding health communities. 
It's not to say that it won't have a health, negative health impact on surrounding communities, but I feel it's important to place this in context. Similarly, the negative impact of the alcohol industry on health, I suspect, will be far greater than the direct impact of shale gas on the health of surrounding communities. Um, so context is important uh, uh, and, and, and proportion is important. Ultimately, the degree of risk to surrounding communities will be very much in be influenced by the extent to which shale gas can be conducted safely and that will be dependent very much on the state of regulation. Public Health England stated that it'll be all fine because we have good regulation in the UK. But the reason why I was very critical of this report was that Public Health England did not make an assessment of the regulatory system or of regulatory capacity when they made this conclusion. They simply assumed that regulation would be effective on the basis of the view that England is good at regulation and England has a good history of effective regulation. We concluded that there were a range of regulatory concerns and that also that there was very strong evidence of regulatory capacity being eroded and we concluded that no assurance could be given that the system would be adequately robust and protective of human and ecological health. So that's how we concluded. Climate change and health um, was not assessed in the Public Health England report at all. But I just want to draw two quotes from the recent Lancet UCL Commission on Climate Change and Health. Um, the purpose of this quote is to indicate that climate change is a really serious threat to human health, both in the UK and globally, as um, illustrated by these two quotes. It could be incompatible with organised global community. It could be sufficient to trigger a discontinuity in the long-term progression of humanity. The impacts of climate change on health operate through a variety of pathways, uh, both in terms of heat effects, extreme weather events, sea level rise, the effects of ocean acidification, potential for mass migration, conflict. This is a diagram again from the Lancet UCL Commission on climate change and health. I bring this up because I don't think we've adequately placed um, the shale gas debate in the context of climate change um, as well as we need to and should. And finally, I just don't want to go into this in any detail, but a large amount of our report is dedicated to addressing this, these two questions. Is shale gas a cleaner source of fuel compared to oil and gas? Secondly, is it clean enough? And if it's clean enough, does it act as a transition fuel? Does it act as a helpful way for us to make the transition from an energy system that is completely unsustainable and incompatible with what we need to do in terms of um, preventing the catastrophic risk of runaway climate change and uh, endpoints of a decarbonized energy system. And again here, these sound like two simple questions, but these questions um, can only be answered adequately if you take into account a whole range of other factors um, about um, the amount of fugitive emissions released in directly into the atmosphere, which I've talked about, whether or not our use of shale gas will actually displace oil and coal. So in the US, we found that the shale gas revolution in the US has displaced oil and coal from the US energy system. However, that oil and coal has merely been exported to Europe so that the total greenhouse gas footprint of 
fossil fuel production from the US has actually gone up in net terms. Um, if we were to produce shale gas, would we be using it in the UK to displace coal? I think it's unlikely. I think it's possibly much more likely that the shale gas we produce will in fact be, be liquefied and be transported and exported abroad. And this will also have a greenhouse gas, a carbon footprint, um, because it takes energy to liquefy and transport gas. Um, it depends on the relative efficiencies of coal and gas power stations, um, affordability, viability, and safety of carbon capture uh, and, and storage methods. So that's another factor that needs to be thrown into the equation. Um, and there's also an issue about the extent to which shale gas will actually deploy, uh, will delay the deployment of renewable energy technologies. Um, and then finally, again, the time horizon over which the global warming potential of shale gas is assessed. So again, a whole range of different factors need to be considered and brought into the equation before you can answer those two important questions about um, the extent to which shale gas is clean or cleaner and the extent to which it acts as a helpful transition fuel towards a decarbonized energy system. I'm going to just fin finally change, um, conclude here by talking about the carbon budget. Even if we were to conclude that shale gas is clean, relatively cleaner, that it will help to displace oil and gas from our energy mix, it is still a fossil fuel. And there is a question as to whether or not we have enough of a carbon budget to even expend, to even um, use shale gas for a limited time period. Um, so this really refers to the issue of, of shale gas being a potential transition fuel. And if effectively, if you start to look, which is what we've tried to describe in our report, at the issue of time frames and the available carbon budget, you know, the take home message is that we have a very short time frame available to make this transition from a carbon based energy system to a decarbonized energy system. And what we've tried, I think, to illustrate in our report is a lot of skepticism about whether or not the ability to produce a commercially viable shale gas industry um, is compatible with what is a very short window of opportunity for shale gas to act effectively as a transition fuel. Um, although we might all potentially feel a little bit more relieved after Paris, um, and certainly if you read the newspapers, you will all feel perhaps that we're on track to address climate change as a global community. Um, if you start looking at the data, you'll actually find that things are really quite alarming. That there is no prospect of us reducing our greenhouse gas footprint over the next 15 years. Um, I think that you know, the, the way things are going at the moment, if you look at the pledges that have been made, um, they are far, far, far away from the kind of trajectory that we need to be able to limit the threats of two degree global warming, um, never mind 1.5 degree <coughs> global warming. Um, and then finally, the last bit of our report says, okay, if shale gas is not a good idea, what are we gonna do? How close are we to a decarbonized energy system? Is a renewable energy system viable? Is the technology there yet? Um, can we move fast enough? Or do we need to do other things? Do we need to start looking at reducing our overall energy consumption? Do we need to start thinking much more seriously about energy efficiency? So it's not enough to just say that shale gas is bad we have to then think about if it is bad, then what? And this is the final bit that we try and address in our report. 
Um, this is the conclusion from our report last year. We did conclude that um, we felt that from an immediate health impact, we felt that there should be at the very least a moratorium on shale gas production um, until further studies could be conducted, until there was a more comprehensive impact assessment. However, when we take climate change into consideration as well, we feel that the arguments really stack up to needing to arrive at a position of advising the government to abandon shale gas production as, um, uh, in its entirety. Having read many, many more papers since that first report, I feel that our conclusions will not change. Um, and if anything, they will become stronger uh, as a result of what we've um, read over the last 15 months. I'm sorry, I've gone over time, um, but I felt it was really important just to try and provide a, um, an overview of our report and how we've arrived at our conclusions. Um, and I'm really pleased to have both Ernie and David here and Patrick here, because um, one of the things that I want to do and ensure is that between now and the final publication of our report, that any mistakes um, will be corrected and that the assessment of our evidence will be as robust and as, ri as rigorous as possible. Um, I'd like all of you to please read the report and if you have any advice on how we can improve the report, um, whether, you think, oops, whether you think there are any mistakes. Uh, uh, <laughs> let me know, let us know. Um, thank you very much.